you know, what we can start out by doing is if you wouldn't mind giving our listeners just a, an introduction to Scrublands and then we will jump off from there. Scrublands is crime fiction. It's set not quite in the Australian outback, but out in the Western Riverina, uh, the Hay Plain. Don't know if you've ever been there. If you're driving between Sydney and Adelaide, it's dead flat. So flat you can see the curvature of the earth, no trees, real landscape, but it's a fictional town. And the book starts with the shocking murder of five people. There's a charismatic young priest called Byron Swift. He's outside the church on a Sunday morning. He's laughing and, and joking with his parishioners. Everything seems totally normal. He goes inside his church to you know, don his vestments to prepare for the service. Then he comes out and inexplicably shoots five people dead before being killed himself. The story proper begins a year later. A rather troubled journalist called Martin Scarson is assigned to go to the town to do what's known as an anniversary story, not about the crime itself, but about how the town is coping a year on from these horrific events. But pretty soon, almost immediately gets there, he starts to suspect that the accepted wisdom, the accepted version of why the priest shot the people is in fact incorrect. And he starts digging. And the more he digs, the more he uncovers. So one of the things that, um that really struck me about this. And, and this will perhaps be a bit of a silly question for a very serious and heavy story, but it seemed to me that you really, I, I could feel your enjoyment as an author writing this story, if that makes sense. Like there just seemed to be so many twists and turns and kind of layers to peel back that it felt like you writing this seemed to be enjoying yourself very much and this was this was your first foray into fiction correct that's right so what had happened is i'd written two non-fiction books and i've said this before i learned three things from from that one is i really enjoyed writing books two i realized i could actually write a book until you have you don't know whether you two or not and the third thing i realized is there is no money writing books in Australia. So I had to go back and I had to get a real job as a journalist again. So I started writing Scrublands, hoping it would get published, believing it would get published, but once again, that you know, I might sell a few thousand copies and that would be it. So in writing it, I wasn't trying to impress agents. I wasn't trying to impress publishers. I wasn't trying to write a bestseller. I was really doing it you know, for my own satisfaction. And I think you're, you're right in saying, I enjoyed it. I made a point of enjoying it. So, um, so that probably comes through. And, you know, there's, there's bits in the book that are quite confronting and, and there's some dramatic action, but there's also sort of periods of humour. Maybe they wouldn't be there if I'd been more focused on trying to write, a, you know, a so-called bestseller. Um, but no, I, and that's what I found. And that's kind of why I was writing it because I do enjoy writing and I do, I do like, um, I do like a good intricate plot too. <laughs> you sure do. <laughs> I will wholeheartedly agree with you on that. And I, there's so many different things. So the reason that I said that, that it seemed like as the author, you were very much enjoying it yourself is there's several different things that to me, as a amateur writer, as an aspiring author myself, like there are things that I find enjoyable. One of them is writing a character that I just adore being in their headspace. Another thing is writing aspects of a story in the instance of Scrublands, like these mysteries and these things that you need to figure out along the way, like that you know the, the reader isn't going to have any idea really about at the at the onset and seeing if you can set that kind of puzzle for them and then the third thing is writing really colorful secondary and tertiary characters which you did in spades and so for you I'm interested what 
what aspect of writing this did you find or maybe or all of your novels really do you find yourself enjoying the most like is it those main characters is it writing is it figuring out those intricate plots like you're referencing or is it these really really interesting secondary characters you're putting together look you know all of the above in a sense <laughs> and, right. and and in writing the book you go through different sort of stages so when i'm writing i tend to write in the in the moment i write subjectively mm-hmm. so you know with a heart if you like um, but then i go back and i sort of edit objectively and i think does this make sense and i'm a bit of what's known as uh and i very much i was with scrublands a pantser as opposed to a plotter so a plotter is someone who plots the book out and then writes it a pantser is someone who writes by the seat of their pants Mm -hmm. so one of the one of the things i thought when i was starting off writing a crime fiction book is how do you bring off the ending in a satisfying way because all of us know who read crime books is there's nothing worse than getting halfway through the book and knowing you know who did it who who the perpetrator was Mm -hmm. Um, although the one thing that might be even you know more annoying is getting 10 pages from the end and the author introduces a new character and you know (laughs) dumps a whole lot of new facts so essentially you feel cheated because you've had no chance to guess who the perpetrator was. Mm-hmm. And my kind of solution, my naive solution to that was, well, I won't have one crime. And mm-hmm. so in Scrubland, seriously, there's four or five different storylines that are all yeah. kind of interwoven. And my theory was, well, if the reader may well guess the outcome of one or two of the storylines, but no one's going to guess all of them. Mm-hmm. Be- and, and I could be really confident in saying that because I didn't, as a writer, I seriously didn't know how I was going to wrap up some of these things. So, you know, I forget if I couldn't, if I didn't know what was mm-hmm. the result was going to be, you know, how the hell could the ride, uh, the reader? Um, yeah. So I'm laughing because um, it, it's been a while at this point, but a while back we did a, a live interview back when we were allowed to do these types of things. Uh, with Harlan Coben here in Cleveland. And he told us that he starts all of his stories by asking himself, what if questions? And it'll be something as simple as like, what if a person was walking in Times Square here in New York and they saw their daughter that they hadn't seen in 10 years? And then he like just goes from there and there. And the reason I'm laughing is because he kind of said exactly what you said. He's like, if I surprise myself, I know I'm going to surprise the reader. But I imagine writing that way means that you also can't be too too attached to your to what you have written like I I feel like you have to be comfortable uh, either abandoning plots or abandoning um, a lot of copy I would imagine just because if you get to a certain point then all of a sudden things before it don't work or did you not find that being something that you came across you look that is absolutely the case Mm -hmm. Uh, particularly with scrublands because I was kind of learning on the job if you like and I did rewrite the end twice quite dramatically so throw out I don't mean tweak I mean throw out 30,000 words 50,000 words completely rewrite Um, I think in that you know I was a journalist for something like 30 years and you get used to having your copy edited um, and you get used to not getting too precious Mm-hmm. Uh, about what you've done because you're moving on to the next story. I think that stood me in good stead. Um, although it wasn't really the editors who were saying, no, that's not working. It, it, it was me. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that is, every all writers, I suspect, or most writers, start with the seed of an idea. Very, It would be quite rare to have the entire plot of a book just kind of come into your mind at once. <laughs> yeah. It's what you it's what you do with the seed of the idea. So the Harlan Caban sort of methodology, I've got the seed of the idea, I'm going to start writing the book. Mm-hmm. So he's a real, he's a real kind of pantser in that respect. And I think maybe Lee Child is the same. Yep. Then you get, then you get writers who go, okay, I've got the seed idea, but before I start 
writing the book, I'm going to, you know, set out all the plot and whatever. And some of them go to extreme lengths. I've heard James Elroy say that, you know, he'll do a treatment 300, 400 pages oh before he starts writing. I've heard Jane Harper here in Australia say that she'll do a treatment of maybe 100 pages, mm -hmm. okay? before the, So when they start writing the narrative, they know exactly where they're going and they can concentrate on making the narrative as good as it possibly can be. Mm -hmm. I come from more the other um, viewpoint and there are people here like the Australian crime writer, Michael Robotham. He's more in the kind of that panther camp, start, see where it's going. Yeah. And the thing that gets to me is when I read these books, you know, and I know the tricks of the trade. I know, you know, how the sausage is made sort of mm -hmm. stuff. I can't tell who's a panther and who's a plotter mm -hmm. unless they've actually, you know, been on the record and, and, and said so. But, uh, but for me, it always begins with a seed of an idea and it just expands from there. Mm -hmm. So taking that a step further you know, with your experience in journalism you know even if you were doing a long form story you know i would imagine you might spend you know two three months working on something it might be longer i you know admittedly i don't have that experience but you know a novel is something where even if you are an absolute have a torrid pace as a as a author you know your books are not short so they, I'm imagining you're spending a lot of time with these stories. So as a person who is kind of pantsing at the big, at the, you know, maybe beginning of the onset of the, the experience, do you get to a certain point when you say, okay, yeah, I, I have enough of a skeleton here where this, this can be a full length novel or you know, are there things that you've abandoned, you know, 20, 25, 30,000 words in where you're just like, you know what, there's just not enough here. Not so far. I mean, fing fingers <laughs> crossed. I am Fair. still relatively new to this game. Um, I suspect, but as, as I've said, there are times when I've thrown out a lot or something just isn't working. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's that two sides of it. There's the sort of getting in and writing and imagining. And when I'm into a book, it's, it's kind of, it's living in my head to an extent. So Typically, I'll work away in the morning actually writing, and then in the afternoon, I'll be, uh, you know, out exercising or doing housework or, you know, running errands, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But typically, the mind is still sort of ticking over. And indeed, um, some of the best ideas come to me, not when I'm sitting at my desk. Yeah. Some of the best ideas come when I'm out, you know, I've gone for a swim or a bike ride or a walk or something like that. Um, so it, it comes a little bit, uh, I wouldn't say all consuming, but maybe ever present. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really, really interesting. I, I'm curious as a, a person who is so ingrained now in this world of writing these books and you, you really seem to have a passion for crime novels in general as well as, an, as a reader, you know, what to you makes a good crime novel? I kind of have, um, I've been thinking about this again recently, and I kind of have two answers to that. One is my answer as a reader, and one is my answer as a writer. Sure. As a reader, I really like characters, nuanced characters, characters that aren't simply good or bad, characters that not only drive the plot, but are affected by the plot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in Scrublands, it wasn't intentional. But one of the things as the writer I was pleased of by the end is that Martin Skarsden, the protagonist, is himself, he doesn't just drive the plot, he's affected by what happens. Mm -hmm. And he goes on something of an emotional story is that there's an element of the redemption story there. So the Martin Skarsden at the end of the book is a different man than the Martin Skarsden at the beginning of the book. That's something that appeals to me uh, as a reader, um, character, I, I also like, I'm very fond of a good writing. A lot of crime is, is the writing is fairly functional. It doesn't really sing on the page. 
And for most readers, I think that's not a problem. And you can tell, I mean, some of the really, really successful uh, crime writers, the use of language isn't is good, but it's not outstanding. Mm -hmm. What they tend to be really outstanding at is pacing, you know, yeah. dropping off to drive the story forward. So there's not like a big dead gap in the middle. Mm -hmm. But for me as a reader, I, li I like character. I like the writing on the page. Often as a reader, the plot for me is a little bit secondary. Mm -hmm. um, but as a writer, I think I'm different because I like doing it. I like plotting. I like having a good plot. Mm -hmm. And as a writer, I'm trying to, you know, it's not like I'm going to say, oh, well, I don't care much for a plot as a reader, so I'm not going to do that as a writer. I think as a writer, you want to get your book to be as good as possible. So you want to, you want to have the best possible characters, the best possible writing, the best plot, the best pacing, you know, the most evocative setting, um, some humour maybe, some good action, you know, so as a writer, I want everything to be good. But as a reader, it's as a reader, I really like books, not just crime books, but books in general that are kind of an immersive read, mm -hmm. the books that you kind of get lost in. And it doesn't matter whether it's a crime book or a historical fiction or, you know, fantasy, whatever it is. It's those books that are able to draw you in. So mm -hmm. when you're reading them, when you pick that book up at night, you're sort of, you're leaving our world behind and you're entering um, an imaginary world. Um, as a reader, they're the books I love. And I guess that does flow over into my writing. I'd love, I'd love it when a reader, you know, compliments me and says, oh, this, this is what happened to me when I read the book. Yeah, that's, you're probably, you may hear one of my dogs in the background having a, a conniption. Yep. How, someone's deigned to walk by my my house while we're doing this, which is okay. Yep. Um, but you're, I, I was laughing a little bit because I'm, I'm thinking about, you were talking about as a reader, you know, people, you think about characters you're really drawn in. And, I, and I'm really thinking about that from a, a crime novel standpoint, not to keep talking about just like the specific genre, yep. but you know, I'm thinking about like, Harry Bosch and Jack Reacher and Martin Scars and like people really do think about these characters like I might pick up a Jack Reacher novel I mean speaking of Lee Child and I probably couldn't think of one specific you know plot that Jack Reacher was involved in that jumps out to me but I always know I'm like I'm going to enjoy this novel because exactly what you said like not only the character but also the pacing of it it, it keeps kind of jumping from from one thing to the next to the next and you know that I think that that's true very much in, in Scrublands as well um not to the extent where we're like a Jack creature you know there's not there's, there's a lot that happens in Scrublands from a, a violence and action standpoint and fires and all these things but there's certainly not like you know international no, it's not a, it's not an action <laughs> book no it's right. more it's more traditional crime to it. yeah but at the same time there are these kind of traditional crime threads that are happening throughout and you mentioned you know there's four or five storylines that kind of keep the reader guessing at all times and I imagine transitioning from being a journalist where a lot of what you're doing is fact finding and fact presenting was there a transition for you from because I mean I, I can definitely see your background as a journalist with the way that Scrub Lens is written because it, there is so much detail that is really really helps paint the picture for a reader but was there that transition between like okay, I'm, I need to write this political piece about, you know, the goings on in the government in insert country here and everything going on. And then you transition to a novel where you're like, okay, I'm going to open this story with a, a priest murdering many people in their congregation. Like, was there a transition for you or did it feel natural just to kind of enjoy yourself writing the story? So while I was writing Scrublands part-time, I was still working... Um, covering national politics here in Australia in, in what's known as a press gallery in Canberra. I was working for the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age, doing more um, uh, video interviews and video production than, than writing. And so Scrublands, writing Scrublands was kind of my escape. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very, I found it incredibly liberating not having to fact check not having to worry about protecting sources, not worried about contempt of parliament or defamation laws or, you know, fact-checking. Um, you know, I could just make stuff up. 
And so rather than, than it being problematic, I found it absolutely liberating. Um, and then just, uh, just as Scrublands was going out to publishers, I actually lost my job. I mean, in, in the downsizing of the media in Australia, that video division at Fairfax, mm -hmm. you know, we were all made redundant. So um, I went and had a, a spectacular three-week career as a political advisor, and then I um, and then I could become a writer full time because I managed to my agent managed to land you know a series of fantastic book deals. Uh, but no, I actually thought when it comes to writing crime books, there are writers who absolutely love the research aspect of it. So you know they'll go and sit in an autopsy and they'll go ride alongs with the cops and they'll try and make everything accurate you know if it's a court scene they'll try to make it conform to jurisprudence um i actually much prefer imagining things mm -hmm. in some ways it's more important that something feels right feels true feels authentic to the reader than it's actually you know completely conforms to reality sometimes you read a book and you can you can see that someone's done a lot of research because the story starts bogging down because they want to you know, demonstrate how well researched it is. <laughs> and, um, you know, having spent 30 years making sure that all my facts were correct. And uh, once again, it's kind of liberating to be able to make, mm. you know, you, you don't even get stuff wrong and you're not going to deliberately get stuff wrong. But I think there's more in it's more powerful in some ways to imagine things than simply to to you know draw on on real life. I saw you wrote a an essay. It was a few years ago at this point. I actually, I think it was after Scrublands came out, where you talked about that transition period and the, your kind of reluctancy to give up calling yourself a journalist, and even like talking about how you didn't you didn't want to turn in your like the the card to the, the um, like the journals uh, guild. I don't remember the, the specific name of it yeah. at this point. Uh, I'm interested just because we don't get too many journalists, you know, former journalists on the podcast. Like what was it that you found joy in when it came to the journalistic aspects of your career um, and the ones that you maybe look back on finally, like what originally made you want to go down that path and you know what kind of kept you going for three decades as a journalist i'm you know i look back now on, on my career as a journalist and i realize how incredibly fortunate i was because i was there in the golden years of newspapers and television in australia where there was money and resources um i spent a long time working for sbs um and I was a roving foreign correspondent for Dateline and two long stints. So I reported um, more than 30 countries around the world, mm -hmm. um, going to some fascinating places, sometimes going to places that tourists would go to, but you see in an entirely different light, you know, right. places like Paris and London and Berlin and Moscow, and also going into fairly dangerous places that you definitely wouldn't go to as a, as a tourist. That gave me, it was such a privilege and working, covering national politics here, it was fascinating and it was important. Um, it's always important now as ever mm -hmm. to really understand what's happening you know, amongst the political class. So that was an enormous privilege. Um, and I don't regret doing it. Sometimes people say, oh, did you wish you'd started writing fiction earlier? Um, it's a bit academic to me because I'm not sure 20 years ago I would have been I would have been able to write the sort of books I do now. Yeah. Um, some people can. Some people you know, are writing brilliant books in their 20s. Um, that wasn't me. I also think I probably needed to write those couple of nonfiction books that helped helped me with my processes and the way of thinking towards a book. Um, so although I'm, I'm absolutely, to, you know, so happy now, you know, I'm kind of living the dream as a writer to be able to write full time, particularly in Australia is quite rare. So um, 
I'm enjoying myself immensely and very happy to be where I am, but I don't regret it all those years as a journalist. I mean, I, I, and it does help my writing. As a journalist, you, over time, particularly if you're covering big stories, if you're covering politics, you get to, you get to see how the world works, you know, behind the scenes, how influence works. Um, and that comes out to an extent in the books, um, understanding, you know, for example, how the media works. So the media are in scrublands. The protagonist is the journalist Martin Skarsden. But as events unfold, it becomes a, like a bit of a, a media swarm. Think something like, you know, Lindy Chamberlain or Chappelle Corby. And the media descends on this small country town way out in Western New South Wales. But a lot of it's used to comic effect because, you know, because <laughs> there's a particularly bumbling television reporter called yeah. Doug Thunkleton, right? So <laughs> Such so a good draws... name, by the way. Not to cut you off, such a wonderful name. <laughs> um, so that draw, that that's drawing on my experience as a journalist, but to add colour and, and a bit of humour to the story rather than that I'm not at all trying to be didactic about the media. I'm not mm. trying to, you know, instill some it's not an essay about you know the state of journalism in australia or anything like that far from it oh man yeah i doug thunkleton i delight just again delightful name delightful character uh, really enjoyed him i so something that i've been thinking a lot about about your career on both sides both a, a journalist and and, and a, you know a published author and as you mentioned you know doing that full time in like this day and age in 2021 I'm curious what aspects you think would be harder to do full-time like when you're just getting started because and I think about you know here in the United States where everything is so politically divided and it feels like even when people have something very intelligent to say and they'll write a piece in like um, the Atlantic it's, it's or just like even like something for like the Associated Press it gets ripped to shreds on both sides, depending on if it leans at all one way or the other, and then it just becomes a political talking point. And it obviously there's there's no room for dialogue whatsoever, at least again in our country here in the states. So I'm I'm curious for you, which one do you think would be more challenging to start now? Would it be trying to get footing as a as an author, or would it be carving out a a career as a political journalist? Well, both. Both are difficult just financially. So the media just doesn't have the sort of money. Yeah. Uh, you know, so much of the business model of the commercial media in Australia is based on advertising. And so much of that advertising has been cannibalised by Google and Facebook that there's very little money left for everybody else, including the news media. Um, I still, though, think it's an incredibly rewarding career to be a yeah. journalist. Um, it seems to, the commercial situation seems to have stabilised. Um, the commercial television stations are making money. The big newspapers, um, uh, the, the Fairfax paper, City Morning and the Age, seem now to have, have reached a point where they're still profitable. Um, in Australia, I think the ABC and SBS are incredibly important. The situation in America, as Adam has described, where even new sources at once were seen as kind of impeccable, like AP or, the, or the, you know, say the New York Times, are now seen by a large part of the population of, you know, are dismissed as being, you know, too left wing or mm -hmm. liberal. I think having the ABC here um, as you know, highly respected, unbiased source of news means that there's a sort of accepted basis of facts and then you can have this freewheeling debate about what those facts mean. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, in the US, it's descended to such a point where even the facts are disputed and the facts are sort of weaponized and politicized. Um, there's lessons to be learned uh, from there. I am worried about the influence of Sky After Dark here, um, which is clearly modelled on Fox News in America. Um, it's something we need to contend with. But being a journalist is a really 
valuable and interesting uh, occupation. And there has been some green shoots here. Some, uh, you know, the Guardian Australian is re still relatively new in Australia, but it's doing well. Um, the Saturday paper, uh, the monthly, these are relatively new news organisations that are doing a good job. Mm -hmm. um, to be a writer, I think in Australia, the market is, is so much smaller than, say, the US. You really have to be prepared to stick with it. Um, and you have to, I think you have to love the process of writing, not just the idea of being a writer or, you know, being successful. Mm -hmm. um, I, I write pretty much every day. Um, and people say to me, wow, that, that's, that shows remarkable self-discipline. But it's, it's actually not that. It's just that I'm kind of addicted to it. So in the, same <laughs> way as, in the same way as I don't feel quite right if I don't have my cup of coffee first thing mm -hmm. in the morning or if I don't feel quite right if I don't go and do some exercise at least once yeah. a day, I don't feel quite right if I'm writing. But, you know, if you, if you want to make money, if you want a stable career, you know, get into real estate or selling cars, <laughs> okay? Writing is for people who, who just love it. And if you stay with it and you persist, you will probably or possibly end up being successful, but I wouldn't count on it. Yeah, that's a wonderful answer. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so I, I do want everyone to know um, if, if anyone is reading Chris's book, Scrublands, and just discovering you as an author for the first time, Scrublands is the first of three books with Martin Skarsen. It's Scrublands, Silver, and Trust. And I will let people look up the other two in that trilogy. But you have a new book coming out in September in Australia, I believe you said, and then in the UK in January called Treasure and Dirt. So do you want to preview that one for everybody just so, you know, if they're familiar with Scrublands already, they have something additional to look forward to? Sure. So, um, Scrubland, Silver and Trust all feature Martin Scarsden and his partner Mandalay Blonde or Mandy Blonde. And um, Silver takes you back to Martin's old hometown and it's a lot of flashbacks to, to when he was a kid. Uh, Trust explores Mandy's past and has her point of view as well as Martin's. Treasure and Dirt is the start of a new series, but it's the same universe, if you like, mm -hmm. contemporary Australia. And indeed, there are some ongoing characters. You know, Doug Funkleton gets a mention. Martin <laughs> Scarson actually, actually gets a mention in, in uh, Treasure and Dirt. He plays a minor role in the plot. Um, and there's two characters, two point of view, and they're police officers. They're New South Wales homicide detectives. Ivan Lukic, who is in the first three books, he's Morris Montefiore's offsider rather surly offsider just a very bit character we get to see what makes him tick and then a new character Nell Buchanan a, a young female detective and and we alternate points of view and it starts it, it's set in an opal mining town up so a kind of fictionalized version of say Lightning Ridge if any anyone's been there so it's a pretty wild and woolly town and it starts with the discovery of a miner who's been crucified and, and his body's been left to rot down his opal mine. And that's how, that's how that starts. So that's our very end of September. I was hoping to go on a book tour in October. Probably won't happen because mm -hmm. of COVID now. Um, but anyway, it'll be out. And so if you like Scrublands, I, I think you will definitely like yeah. Treasure and Dirt. Wow, you really know how to read an opening scene to a book my goodness <laughs> um, um, true true story about scrublands the idea i think of of scrublands was the opening scene for me was the journalist going to this small town that he'd never been before um, and i think in part it's based on a story i did for dateline in east texas where I went to a town called Jasper, where an African-American man called James Bird Jr. had been um, dragged to death. He'd been white extremists had tied him to the back of a pickup truck and dragged him until he was dead. And it was a crime that just absolutely shocked the US and, and worldwide. And I went there some months later, like Martin, 
not to do a story on the murder because in, in, in Jasper, it was very clear who the perpetrators were and they'd been caught. Um, it was about how the town itself was coping. So that was a kind of idea that I'd started with Scrublands. And it was only on a bat, and, I was, and it was a bit slow because he's arriving and he's got a really dead kind of town. And it was only when I got to about the fourth draft, I went, oh, I know, I'll, I'll write a prologue. I'll, I'll write the scene where the priest actually does the shooting. It, you know, in retrospect, it is such an obvious way to get into the book. Um, but, and then in, um, but, you know, in Silver, there's not a prologue in it like that, a, a scene set like that. Um, because just in the normal flow of the story, there is a body in the, in the first chapter anyway. Um, but again, in um, Treasure and Dirt, you have that kind of dramatic prologue once again. Yeah, if people can read this, the prologue of Scrublands and not want to keep reading, I don't know who those people are. They're going to absolutely love it. Um, Chris, last, last question for you. What do you hope readers take away from reading these books? Look, I hope they enjoy it and get something out of it. I think it's it's um, trying to tell readers what they should get out of it is fraught with difficulty because I have learned, you know, touring around after the books have come out, people read books and, and get such different things out of them. Sometimes you wonder if they're reading the same book. Um, and it makes you realise as a writer that, that once you've put all the work in it and the, and the words are there on the page, it's not as if they're set in stone. It's like there's two creative processes going on. One's my bit in writing it, but the other is the reader's. And, you know, I was talking before that immersive experience when you, when you get into a good book. And I think that's why books endure, mm -hmm. because it, it allows the reader to imagine the world they're entering and so for some people you know i've had had two people side by side say to me that they both loved the book i'm talking about scrublands here and one has said oh i just love those short descriptive passages you capture the feeling of the land so well that's such a highlight for me and the other person saying no, 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 get rid of all that. I just want the plot. I just want to find out <laughs> who did it. I really love the plot. So for different readers, different things will appeal. And it's always interesting speaking to readers to find out what's worked for them, yeah. you know, what, what's, you know what, what's ticked their box. That is absolutely perfect. I, pers I personally loved all of it, but I'm also a book nerd. So every little, I wanted every single page and it was fantastic. Everyone, I, if you haven't read Scrublands yet, you're going to absolutely adore it. Chris, thank you so much for joining me today. That's fantastic. Thank you so much.